Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Hoosier Energy, providing electricity to southern and central Indiana electric cooperatives and their member customers. Information at HEPN.com and by WTIU members. Thank you. Right now on Indiana News Desk. Indiana's rate of sexual assault among teenage girls is the second highest in the country, with nearly one in five girls being raped before she graduates high school. It's imperative that we find out why. Why are we second worst in the nation? It is just not acceptable. And we have to do something now, and we have to protect our girls. Ahead, what lawmakers are doing to address the epidemic among Indiana's teens. A Chinese school in Terre Haute. On the Google Translate thing, I, I was really fascinated in writing down all the Chinese Chinese symbols. So then my mom said, hey, why don't you learn the real way to say it? There's a Chinese school downtown. It used to be a place where parents could send their adopted kids to learn about Chinese culture, but it's expanding to include adults. And we go back 50 years to the largest disaster in Indiana history. Without any warning of any kind, all of a sudden there was a terrific explosion. That and a look at this week's headlines right now on Indiana News Desk. Hello, I'm Joe Wren and welcome to this week's Indiana News Desk. Indiana ranks second to worst in the country for the number of sexual assaults among high school aged girls. Nearly one in five 9th to 12th grade girls in Indiana is raped before she graduates. It's a story we first brought you in February in our documentary Shadows of Innocence, Sexual Assault Among Indiana's Youth. The documentary and the study that inspired it was a wake-up call to many people. And as Sarah Whitmire reports, the issue is now getting the attention of Indiana lawmakers. For eight years, this Indiana teen was assaulted by her brothers. I, I kind of felt like it was wrong, but I wasn't really sure. Through all the years of being raped, she never told anyone. She worried people in her family would get angry. I more of just like closed my eyes and waited for it to get over. Her mother caught her brothers one day while they were assaulting her, and that's how it finally stopped. For many reasons, it can take years for sexual assault victims to come forward. And in Indiana, only 15 percent of sexual assaults, attempted rapes and rapes are ever reported to the legal authorities. They feel ashamed about it. They don't feel it's easy to talk to anyone about. They feel like people won't believe them. They usually don't go to the police. It's more true for women, by the way. Women are more likely to blame themselves. If they were to blame, did they not say no early enough? Did they not say no hard enough, uh, strongly enough? Did they not struggle strong enough? All these questions. So there's a whole bunch of self-doubts just around the victim. All those questions were going through Malia Crosby's head after a high school friend raped her two months before her 17th birthday. It was such an, an incredibly painful and scary experience that I just left. That was the only option I think that at that time that my body had, um, maybe my mind had to just retreat from it. Um, and then I've kind of now realizing that the last 16 years I've kind of um, been really disconnected. And, you know, things happen around me and I don't remember certain, certain periods um, of time. I feel numb a lot of the time, just um, don't really feel anything. Malia was among do. those who testified this week at the State House when Representative Christina Hale proposed a measure encouraging a deeper look into why sex crimes and even crimes of domestic violence aren't reported. Hale called the problem of sexual assault the most urgent issue the state is facing. We have 17.3 percent of girls in Indiana who have been raped or sexually assaulted by the time they're in high school. That said, we don't know why. We don't know if this is a problem with families, if it's a problem in school. Is it a rural problem? Is it an urban problem? We don't know where it's happening or why it's happening. And we can't do something about it. We can't create the right programs, policies, and laws unless we find out why this is happening. 
This kind of legislative action was one of the goals of the policy brief that inspired our documentary. The study by researchers at Indiana University's Kinsey Institute and the Center for Evaluation and Education Policy urged lawmakers to work with stakeholders to assess the status of sexual violence across the state to gather accurate data indicating the scope of the problem that could be used to inform policy decisions. The study highlighted states that had good sexual violence prevention policies on the books. And while noting that policies are only part of the solution, the report's authors encouraged leaders in Indiana to learn from these other states. I think the interesting thing in, in these other model states, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Texas, is that it wasn't one policy lever that they tried to pull. It was really them sitting down, looking across all their existing laws and policies and regulations, and really coming up with a comprehensive approach to see if they're actually solving this problem. So the measure proposed this week can be considered a first step. Hale says she hopes the committee's work will result in policy, programming, and law that will better protect children from sexual crimes. This is one step in a larger solution precisely because there are a lot of people that are going to have to be engaged to solve this problem. We can only go up from here and I'm feeling very confident and very positive that we can do something positive for our young girls. Sarah Whitmire who reported on the story and produced the Shadows of Innocence documentary joins us for more. Boy, every time I see, we've done a lot with this and every time I see and hear the, these stories I still, it's hard to hear. It is, the numbers are really startling yeah. and the thing is Indiana's rate is nearly double the national average. 17.3% of high school age girls are raped before they graduate. Yeah, and the national rate is about 10.5%, so we're much higher. And what we know is that's really underreported. That was a lot of the reason that there was this meeting at the State House this week, as people sat down and they realized, okay, well, we're saying, we have these numbers from the CDC that say nearly one in five high school age girls in Indiana will be raped before she graduates. And then we have these other numbers that say fewer than half of all rapes are reported. So given that, what are the actual numbers? Are they double? Are they triple? Advocates are saying we know they're much higher than what we think they are. Now you talked about the uh, first step was the state house. Now what? Yeah, so yesterday, Representative Hale made her pitch to lawmakers at the State House, and the committee chairman said he wanted an official proposal by the end of November. So by November 30th, he wanted an official proposal, and then they meet one more time this year in December. So he said at their December meeting, then they'll consider her proposal. Any ideas of what will be in that specifically, in that proposal? I mean, that's a really good question, because Christina Hale would love to just pass something now. She's found these numbers about sexual assault in part from our documentary and she wanted to do something immediately. But then she realized that's not, that would never pass. That's never going to go anywhere because where's the evidence behind that? We've got to have some numbers that really document this problem in Indiana. Is it, like she said, a rural problem? Is it an urban problem? How do we know so that then how can we measure success? And it was something that the committee chairperson was actually pushing back with her a bit and saying, I don't quite understand what you're asking of us. So really what she's getting at in this first step is she just wants to do a study. She, at the panel yesterday, there were some researchers there who could speak to what they might be looking for in a study. But then I assume there'll be some funding issues too. Where will the money come from? Where would the money come from and how much would it cost? That was something Representative Pierce was asking about because it, you know there are so many different ways they could hire an outside agency, they could have a state agency do it which would be cheaper. Right now Indiana doesn't allocate any money for young victims of sexual abuse except for like immediate crisis services but other than that there's nothing. So they would have to come up with the money. And that's something we went and talked to the Monroe County Prosecutor Chris Gall because his office does a lot for sexual assault prevention efforts. Arguably they, have, they do more than anyone in the state. And he said that's such an important piece of this that whatever the state decides there has to be funding attached to it. And we have a clip of Chris Gall. We do. Well, it's, I think it's important that we look at uh, prevention and education, that we study the problem, uh, get a handle on it. The numbers for Indiana are pretty disturbing, as Shadows of Innocence pointed out. Uh, you know, we have the second highest teen rape uh, statistics in the country, and, and that's, that's alarming. So 
uh, it's important to study the problem. It's also important to put resources behind addressing that problem. We really need uh, the legislature, in addition to thinking about policies and prevention and education, to also be thinking about uh, how we can fund uh, specialization in the response so that when those, when those unreported cases come forward, those victims report that our response uh, is up to the challenge that that creates. Okay, well, thank you very much, Sarah. And thank of course, you. we talked about the documentary. Okay. Um, that was back in February, but of course, you can see that on our website and find more at indianapublicmedia.org slash shadows. Thanks. Well, for a look at news headlines from across the region, we now go over to Alex Dirkman. Alex. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Joe. Starting today, more than 900,000 Hoosiers are seeing their food stamp benefits reduced. A one-person household is losing about $11 a month, and a family of four is losing $36 a month. That's nearly a week's worth of meals. Since 2009, the federal government has been pumping money into the food stamp program through the Stimulus Act, but that funding ran out today. The FDA hasn't reached a decision on whether to place stricter regulations on e-cigarettes. In September, Indiana Attorney General Greg Zeller and 39 other attorneys general signed a letter to the Food and Drug Administration asking for stricter rules on e-cigarette sales and advertising. Unlike traditional tobacco, e-cigarettes currently have no age requirement to purchase them and there are no restrictions on advertising. The attorneys general had urged the FDA to meet an October 31st deadline to reach a decision, but because of the government shutdown, the FDA's decision has been delayed. Historically, Indiana hasn't worried about water shortages, but last year's severe widespread, widespread drought came as a wake-up call to state legislators and industry officials who are now commissioning a study to look at water supply and demand in the state. Gretchen Frazee has more. Hydrogeologist Jack Whitman sums up Indiana's water policy in a sentence. I don't know if the situation is dire from a water supply perspective. What I think it's dire is from a legal and, and policy perspective, as well as planning. Indiana has an existing water shortage plan. Whitman was part of the task force that updated it seven years ago. He says the big gap in Indiana's plan, though, is that there's no policy for determining which water users get priority in the event of severe shortages. Whitman and an advisory committee representing various industries and municipalities will spend the next eight months surveying the supply of water throughout different regions in Indiana. They'll also talk to local governments and utilities to find out what plans they have in place for water shortages. We need to look at this together because all the interests have the same goal. They all want adequate supplies and they all need it most in the shortage condition. So that's my biggest worry. Whitman says northern Indiana is relatively home free on groundwater levels, while southern Indiana is significantly worse. Central Indiana, with Indianapolis and its water demands in the middle, is the most vulnerable. The study begins in November and runs until next summer. Negotiations helped lower the number, but still more than 130 people lost their jobs at the GE plant in Bloomington. Yesterday was their last day of work. 56 workers were laid off and 75 qualified for early retirement. GE told employees about the cuts last month. Officials blame the layoffs on a decline in sales of the side-by-side -side refrigerators manufactured at the plant. GE officials say laid off workers will get preferential placement in other locations and will be given health care benefits for another year. Crane Army ammunition activity officials say they're working to comply with safety policies outlined by the U.S. Department of Labor. The Labor Department cited Crane for 36 safety violations this week. It was inspecting the facility after an explosion occurred there in March. No one was seriously injured, but the report says 34 of the violations could have resulted in death or physical harm. Violations included inconsistent equipment inspections and not training workers on safety procedures. But Crane officials say they were following the following safety standards. They were just following the ones set by the Army and not the Labor Department. Uh, some of the notices issued by OSHA in the press release um, we feel are differences in terminology between the Army safety regulations that we follow and their own OSHA um, safety procedures. The spokesman says Crane officials are now working with both parties to align the standards, but they don't know how long it will take. Indiana University is joining Cummins and Eli Lilly in vowing to fight a proposed constitutional amendment that would de define marriage as strictly between a man and a woman. 
They signed on as members of Freedom Indiana, a bipartisan campaign created to oppose the measure. In a statement, IU President Michael McRobbie said the proposed constitutional amendment runs counter to IU's deeply held values. IU spokesman Mark Land says it's simply bad business. Some of the same concerns that folks like Cummins and Eli Lilly have when it comes to you know, the kind of message that this amendment would send to prospective employees and to people you know, around the world about Indiana as a place that's intolerant of, you know, of, of diversity and equality. And while IU is taking a firm stance on the issue, a Purdue University spokesperson said this week officials there would not do the same, saying Purdue has traditionally declined to comment on social issues. A report researchers at Morgan Stanley released this week shows a global wine shortage could be on the horizon. The report shows wine consumption continues to outpace production and is projected to only get worse. The shortage is mainly being felt in Europe, which is where more than half of the world's wine is produced. A spokesperson for Indiana's wine industry says the shortage could present an opportunity for Hoosier winemakers who can step up and fill the overseas demand. More than 100 police dogs and their trainers are learning search and rescue techniques at Muscatatuck Urban Training Center just north of Columbus. This is the third year the International Police Dog Association has hosted the training at Muscatatuck. As Tom Brinkman reports, the teams come from around the world to train for a variety of missions. The canines are trained in specialized tactics including search and rescue missions, drug seizures, bomb discoveries, and patrol work. Two-year-old German Shepherd Trace is one of them. He's been trained to detect 20 different odors that are associated with explosives. He's an amazing worker. He does really great at his job and he loves it. Trace belongs to Jennifer Hall, a canine officer from Toronto. Hall says Muscatatuck is an ideal location for the training because it allows owners to practice a wide variety of scenarios, from searching in lakes for human bodies to scanning abandoned buildings for explosives. It's an incredible facility. I don't think there's anywhere else in North America that we could do all of the different aspects that we have going on here this week. There's just nowhere else that compares. And a 15-foot-tall statue of Larry Bird will be moved to Indiana State University next week. The statue was revealed at the Pacers opener Tuesday night. It all started as an idea from an Indiana State University student. He saw a statue of Bird's old-time rival Magic Johnson at Michigan State's campus and thought ISU needed a similar tribute to its basketball legend. And the rivalry continues. The artist who crafted Larry Bird's statue made sure it would stand about two feet taller than Magic Johnson's. <laughs> Joe. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. A place for children to learn about Chinese culture is expanding to include education for adults. Our state impact team explains big changes to the state's A through F grading system and why it could mean more testing for students. And 50 years ago, the largest disaster in Indiana history took place. Ahead, we dig into the archives and take you back to the state fairgrounds to hear from people who survived the explosion. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. We are a nation of explorers. We seek new ways of living, of thinking, and of expressing ourselves. We take risks, we learn from experience, and we keep moving forward. That's why we encourage and celebrate the explorer in all of us. Frontline provides me with information that makes me think. First I shout at the television. You've got to be kidding! You won't see this anywhere else. The stories hit close to home. Truth is a very valuable commodity. They're uncompromising. I want to do something. I want to take action. It changed the way I actually live my life. It lets me make up my mind. I trust it. When I watch Frontline. It makes me angry and it makes me want to voice it. I want to make a difference. We can make a difference. Frontline. These guys are my heroes. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. I'm Joe Wren. The Chinese school of the Wabash Valley started classes when a group of parents in Terre Haute with adopted children noticed the lack of cultural learning opportunities. The group has met every Saturday for six years to discuss customs and work on language skills. As Claire McInerney reports, the program is now expanding to teach adults as well. Kurt Debon adopted his first daughter from China in 2004. And after his second one came home in 2007, he decided he wanted his girls to have a connection to where they were born. But Terre Haute didn't have any opportunities to learn about Chinese culture. 
So Debon started a new school that his daughters and other children adopted from China could learn Chinese. We think they would have great opportunities down the road as adults if you know they can have the best of both worlds. They can have one foot in Asia and one foot in the United States and be able to work with both, uh, both communities. Soon, the Chinese School of the Wabash Valley was instructing the children of Chinese immigrants to read and write in Chinese. And now, the classes include children from a variety of backgrounds. No child interested in learning Chinese language or culture is turned away. I was really fascinated in writing down all the Chinese, Chinese symbols. So then my mom said, hey, why don't you learn the real way to say it? This year, the school expanded its curriculum to another group of students, adults. Rather than attracting students born in China, the adult class caters to people generally interested in Chinese, or those who grew up around the culture but don't know the technical aspects of the language. All of the Chinese school's teachers are volunteers, including Yi Chong. She teaches the five students in the adult class and says it's very different from working with children. Kids pick up languages a lot more quickly, and most of the classes at the Chinese school use games and other activities designed for kids. With the adult class, Chong likes to share personal anecdotes about China as part of her lessons. Because some of them went to China, been to China, so they know, yeah, I know that, and they bring like a new topic so we can make a small discussion. Sometimes we get off subject, but I think that's good for them to interact. Although the Asian population in Terre Haute is less than 1.5% of the population, Many students in the program believe being more knowledgeable about a different culture will help the community as a whole. For Debon, it's more personal. After founding the school for his girls, he's become a student himself. He says learning Chinese has helped him connect to his daughters and given them a shared interest. My great saying is, I will learn Chinese before I die. So I have a long time to go. We have heard a lot in recent months about Indiana's A through F grading system for schools. That system is due for yet another remake. State Impact Education reporter Kyle Stokes is here. Kyle, why are state leaders so focused on this right now? Well, Joe, you hear about this all the time from education leaders when they talk about school performance. If you can measure it, you can improve it. But last legislative session, state lawmakers said Indiana's grading system for A through F wasn't measuring schools in the right way. This week, a panel of district superintendents, teachers, and policymakers like state schools chief Glenda Ritz came up with a plan to overhaul that rating system. The new way wouldn't compare students' performance to that of their peers. That's what the growth model does now. Instead, the concept the panel approved would place student scores into several performance levels, and then the new system would figure how many students in a school bumped their scores up to a higher level. Now, standardized testing opponents were upset to hear the new grading system conceptually involved involves new tests for first and second graders, and one panelist voiced his concerns that the idea hasn't been developed enough yet for the state board to vote on it by a mid-November deadline. Now that's for calculating next year's school grades. So what about this year's school grades? According to a Department of Education memo sent to district officials statewide, the state wants to make schools grades public by November 22nd. Delays in releasing the grades were inevitable after a controversy over how Tony Bennett staff handled handled last year's grades and widespread problems with the online spring I-STEP exams. But the DOE's speed in releasing the grades has become a political issue, with State Board of Education members accusing Ritz of r dragging her feet. Ritz says her staff doesn't yet have all the data that it needs to calculate those grades. Normally, this is an off year for elections in Indiana, but four communities will go to the polls this upcoming Tuesday to vote on school referenda. In Muncie, Michigan City, Goshen, and Mishawaka, the property tax increase is the only issue on the ballot, so the school district is actually paying the cost of holding the election. Price tag, thousands of dollars in each district, potential payoff, millions of taxpayer dollars. And Joe, in Muncie, that's money the district says it needs. They want to keep school buses on the roads. Mm, interesting. Thank you very much, Kyle. And now we take a look back to what was making the news in our History Through Headlines segment. The date was November 1st, 1963. Kennedy was president. Sugar Shack by Jimmy Gilmore and the Fireballs was the number one single. And Hoosiers experienced one of the worst disasters in state history. The headline reads, 65 killed, hundreds hurt in Coliseum gas explosion. The night when a performance of the Holiday on Ice show turned into a Halloween horror.
4,300 people were watching Holiday on Ice at the Indiana State Fairgrounds Coliseum when faulty propane tanks were ignited by a popcorn maker underneath the stands. All of a sudden there was a terrific explosion and a gas flame about 50 feet high roared into the air and the bodies were laying all over the arena. It was the most horrible spectacle that I ever witnessed. Emergency services spent days digging through the rubble searching for survivors. The city didn't have the means to handle a disaster of this size, so the ice rink was used as a temporary morgue until the bodies were identified by family members. In all, 75 people died and nearly 400 were injured. Many would remember November 1963 for a different tragedy. Three weeks later, President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. And Kyle, what I find fascinating too is that file footage, yeah. uh, they've certainly presented news a lot different than we yeah. now 50 a lot years different. ago. The horror on ice thing, I think probably a little too much, yeah. um, but certainly very interesting footage, very interesting also to see the similarities between just a few years ago with the stage fair collapse, yeah. the state fair collapse. And Absolutely. Well, that's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news in southern Indiana throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Tonight, we leave you with images of the beautiful scenery at Brown County State Park. This is the busiest time of the year when thousands of tourists flock to the park to enjoy the fall colors. It helps you relax a little bit and get away from the hustle bustle of everything. Just get a chance to wind down. And for all of us here at WTIU, have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Hoosier Energy, providing electricity to southern and central Indiana electric cooperatives and their member customers. Information at HEPN.com and by WTIU members. Thank you.